Welcome to week three of, of RSET's webinar series on disaster management. As always, I am your host, Brock Blevins. With me is Tim Stow, and we have a special guest speaker today, Ira Leifer. Once again, the course material will be found on our webpage, as you can see here. This will include all PDFs of the presentations, all recording links, as well as any homework assignments. And as I mentioned, this is week three. Week one, we covered earthquakes, tsunamis, and, and volcanoes. Week two, wildfire disasters, which brings us to week three today, the observation of oil spills using remote sensing measurements. With that, I will pass this on to Ira, and thank you very much. Enjoy. Oh, oh, my name, hello everyone, is Ira Leifer. I was a researcher at the University of California, Santa Barbara, until I left to start um, as a researcher at my own company. Uh, my um, area of interest has been methane, including remote sensing of methane, and working with methane in Santa Barbara where there's natural oil and gas seeps, we found that the oil was an interferent. And uh, with actually doing the methane remote sensing, when Deepwater Horizon occurred, the interferent became our main topic or subject. And so as a result, um, I became involved and led the NASA remote sensing uh, response to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And I've had support for this uh, effort between uh, NASA, NOAA, and USGS for much of the uh, um, uh, slides that are in here. Although, because I'm trying to uh, explain uh, how things uh, work, there are a number of slides that I just grabbed from the web. Okay. Um, my uh, professor, my advisor as a grad student, had a sign on the wall, which you can see represented here. And the reality about oil spill science is that we know that we don't know very much. There is um, very little certainty and a lot of uncertainty. Yet the main uh, impetus of disaster response is whether you're certain or not, you need an answer because decisions need to be made. Um, and one of the tools that is gaining acceptance and has enormous potential uh, is remote sensing for improving oil spill response. So what is remote sensing? It's the ability to look at and measure um, from a distance, the uh, surface or atmospheric properties, oil on the surface, smoke in the air, toxic gases. And remote sensing can be very advantageous for disaster response, both because, one, it can give a large field of view. Um, and secondly, because you may not want to actually go into the area, or there may not be an opportunity during an oil spill. No one wants remote sensors or people getting in the middle of cleaning up the oil. Or in a volcano or a fire, it may be dangerous. Remote sensing allows us to collect data when we can't get to the area for logistical reasons or for practical safety reasons. Um, we're going to uh, artificially, or not so, divide remote sensing into two types. One is passive, which uses the light from the sun or the thermal emissions. It has the advantage that the sun illuminates really nicely everything, um, and thermal radiate goes from everywhere. Uh, but it's not necessarily in the spectra we want or in the character, and it's not always there, nighttime, no sun, in which active radiation from radar or LIDAR, laser, can provide very focused energy for sensing uh, surface properties and for trying to 
um, collect data when the sun is not available, for example. Um, remote sensing generally is used to make a map. And in the map, we discriminate between the target that's of interest and the target that's not. So the scene will be filled with many objects that are not relevant. And in the case of oil, oil. We want to discriminate the oil and segment it away from the other um, aspects of the scene and do this accurately. One of the important parameters for remote sensing is how fine the pixels are. Um, for example, in uh, panel A, I'm going to get the arrow up um, over here. Um, we could not discriminate between these two objects, the star and the box, because they're both within one pixel based on, well, their color. Um, however, if we had far more accurate, uh, smaller, finer pixels, we might be able to do that. And the resolution needed to resolve the structures um, can be fairly coarse, which is uh, evidenced by these pixelated images of uh, two well-known figures, Mona Lisa and Abraham Lincoln. Our eyes and our brains are able to recognize the patterns and infer what we're looking at, even though they're very poorly resolved. They're certainly not high-quality images, yet we can still identify them and segment them from the background. Segmenting from the background can be done by two manners, one of which is by texture, which our eyes use, and using all the brains, and one of them is by color, albedo, darkness. Um, however, uh, as this example shows, when you use pure color, um, if there's a gradient across the image, it may be hard to discriminate by a segment by thresholding the bushes from the background um, because the bushes are, your eye can do it, um, and there's a local contrast, but there's not an even gradient. And actually getting an algorithm based on contrast to identify these bushes will be quite hard. However, if one uses a texture approach, we can uh, do it quite robustly. Um, as you can see in panel D, which is something that our brain and our eyes are very good at doing, um, even with all sorts of clutter and other um, items. Uh, it's important, though, to be able to have algorithms to do this, um, because the amount of data, one really doesn't want to use a, a human to try to, on every particular case, do the analysis. Um, here we're looking at different characters of oil uh, with you know regular video imagery, and one can see a lot of variability. This is from Deepwater Horizon, um, but we can also recognize a pattern. So in panel A, um, oil has been pushed and is maintaining a nice sharp edge, which makes it easy to discriminate. There's some looks like thicker oil in this area that shows up as a very low contrast difference. Um, and then there's some sheen over here, which would be very, very thin. Um, but this area of thick oil that I'm showing with the green arrow could actually be like you see in panel B, um, because we have a different scene geometry and illumination. And one of the patterns one sees here that is real world is that oil bunches up on one side. This is the wind pushes it together. Oil wants to spread. On the downwind side, it spreads and is more diffuse. So oil tends to have sharp edges, and then thin oil is off to the downwind side. These kind of patterns can be used by a trained observer to discriminate oil from false positive look alike. Another way of helping to discriminate um, is our knowledge of uh, physics, if you will. This boat has passed, and it's the same boat that you see in panel C, through the oil slick, 
and in its wake it's cleared the oil away. So we know that this area is not heavily oiled, though it probably has some sheen. And there, there's oil um, in the area where the boat hasn't gone to. A lot of variability. Lower left, dispersants may have been sprayed in this area because the appearance of the oil goes from rather clear to rather hazy. But it's hard to interpret. You can see even the background where my arrow is the drill ship that was burning and flaring off oil um, uh, that was used to recover oil from the seabed. Those images were all of oil. Here we're showing images that look a little bit similar. On the left, it's not oil. On the right, it is. So panel B, we know this is oil because usually, not always, Thick oil is surrounded by sheen, the volatile stuffs that kind of spread off from it, whereas the algae on the left doesn't have a sheen because it's algae, not oil. Um, in the next one, you can see sargassum, a floating seaweed, um, on the left. And on the right is some weathered oil that looks very similar and also has no sheen because it's weathered. Um, in panel E, on the left is algae, and on the right is oil that may have been submerged by dispersants. They look very similar. What this means is that untrained observers who wouldn't necessarily know to look for these other patterns, like the sheen surrounding the oil here, but not around these algae, um, untrained observers are likely to make reports of oil spills or in the event of oil, report areas where the oil they think is, but there's no oil there. False positives are a very important um, thing to be able to discriminate against uh, so that one doesn't send assets to where they're not needed. Um, remote sensing, which has far more colors than the three colors of our eyes, um, can use the entire spectrum uh, extending from uh, microwaves out to ultraviolet for oil. When you look at a spectrum with our eyes, it looks nice and clean, pure, beautiful colors. Um, however, when you look in greater detail for the light from the sun, you can see all these black marks in the spectra, which are molecular adsorptions in the atmosphere um, adsorbing light. Well. We can use these features, in the case of oil, um, to try to discriminate, based on the spectral color of oil, from other aspects of the environment that do not have hydrocarbons like oil. So in the visible, where we see uh, extending from around 400 to around a little before 600 in this area, there are no spectral features in the oil of significance. The colors and the variations are all based on the thickness of the film and the amount of water in it. And as a result, they're very scene dependent and they're not diagnostic. Diagnostic means, just like when you go to the doctor and get a diagnosis, that the oil is identified as oil and not something else. In the shortwave infrared, uh, somewhere in particular about 1,700 and 2,300 nanometers, um, and these are just infrared colors, in these areas the oil actually does have adsorbance. This is the color, the spectral color of oil, and these are unique, and these feature, features here are related to vibrations in the carbons and hydrogens that make up oil. Um, and they happen to overlap with the vibrations you get in methane, which is also made of carbon and hydrogens. So these structure here, this little doublet, is because of the uh, way the oil or the methane vibrates when it gets energized or hit by sunlight, um, or when it gets hit by a laser. Um, now, Oil initially, well, first off, oil is the second most complex substance on Earth, the first being dirt. Um, 
oil typically has hundreds of thousands of different distinct chemical components in it. It's um, amazing stuff made from those old dinosaurs. But the uh, loosely, you can put separate oil into two components. Ones which are the light end, which get refined and put in gasoline. They're clean chains of carbon and hydrogen that burn nicely, that evaporate, and that drive the absorption feature strongly. However, after they evaporate away, one's left with a much more complex chemical compounds, um, alkane chains with branches, multiple uh, double carbon bonds, ring components. And so as a result, this oil here, which has been weathered, the spectral signature drops because those nice clean carbon hydrogen chains are gone, leaving the asphaltines and the other components behind. This was used during Deepwater Horizon to develop a spectral approach to um, figuring out how thick the oil was. And for different oil water emulsions, and oil in the real world is almost always in a mixture of oil and water, microscopic droplets of oil and microscopic droplets of water in what looks like oil to the human eye. And as you can see, there's a very different spectral shape based on the emulsion. And the thickness also has an effect. So as you get thinner, these little wiggles over here um, become different. This feature here with the arrow 1.5 is from water. Now this is oil emulsion sitting on top of water. So um, that, that's a primer again. We'll come back to more detail on that, but on how oil appears spectroscopically in the shortwave infrared. As I mentioned before, remote sensing provides a synoptic view. You know, it's easy to see all of Europe, for example, in a single satellite image um, that you simply can't get from the ground. You can, with space-based um, observations, you can uh, target areas um, that may be inaccessible currently at the time of the spill to airplanes or to uh, eyes on the ground. You can collect data when weather may prevent an airplane from taking off. You know, the imagery can be easily shared with the public to uh, keep the oil spill and oil spill response efforts um, in to inform the public uh, and not leave a vacuum of understanding on terms of the public. And you can even use remote sensing to, uh, to evaluate ecological damage and recovery. Now, anything that uses the visual spectrum, well, you can't have clouds or you can't see the oil. You also need sunlight, and there is no sunlight at nighttime. In the Arctic, that's six months of the year. Um, the workhorse, therefore, because of those limitations, um, is radar. And radar sees right through the clouds. Um, it works day and night because it's active. Sounds perfect. Well, there are a lot of false positives. Low wind, you can't use radar. It isn't clear how well it sees thick oil and to discriminate that from thin oil. It responds to very, very thin oil. Oil so thin, there's nothing that responders can do. At high wind speeds during a storm, um, the oil's not on the surface because it's being injected into the water column. Radar won't see that. Well, SAR radar can't see it at that point because it can't discriminate the oil on the surface from the bubble plumes, and much of the oil is under water. And there are some other issues related to um, satellite data, but still, it may be the only thing one has, and so it's a very important tool to be able to use um, to get information for responding to an oil spill. In contrast, if you put a remote sensing image on an airplane, which could be as simple as a camera or as complex, that's georeferenced, or as complex as um, the Avaris, which is a hyperspectral imager, um, 
then you can get much higher spatial resolution. Um, and you, it's taskable. So when the satellite comes through the area and acquires its image, there could be clouds over part of the spill. They might clear later. So with an airplane, you can send it to where the clouds aren't at one point and then move it to another area as that area clears um, out. And the airplane may be able to loiter to stay on site um, and make observations, which the satellite will continue moving in orbit. Um, and there are some, you know, obvious signal to noise benefits because you're much closer to the source. Okay. Before getting, and I know I mentioned this earlier that there's a lot we don't know. Well, that is really true, and the best way to quantify oil spill science is it's a need-based science. An answer is needed. The answer is needed right now, not after two weeks of analysis in a graduate student laboratory. And so a reliable answer that's not accurate in the next few hours is valuable. An accurate answer tomorrow is often useless. And so the goal is to be able to produce um, results and observations uh, in a timely manner that are um, reliable but not necessarily accurate. Okay. I apologize that this slide is hard to read, so I, I'll read it for everyone. Um, with oil spill science, the first thing you want to do using remote sensing is triage. You know, where firstest is bestest. What that means is where are you going to send assets first? Where is it best to send the assets? Assets being uh, skimmers, oil booms, boats to collect, um, and so on. You can use remote sensing to identify where the thick oil is, which is the second point. And it's important to worry about false positives. You can also attempt to use the remote sensing of oil to determine how much oil is out there. If it's 50 barrels or if it's 5,000 barrels, you need a rather different amount of oil boom and boats. It's also remote sensing can help us know where the oil is going, its trajectory. So the, the typical way one deals with this is with a model. One runs a numerical oil spill model and uses that to predict where the oil goes. And the reality is that the oil spill models almost never are correct until data has been put in that allows the oil spill model to be tuned. So one can use remote sensing data to improve or tune the oil spill model so that it starts producing accurate predictions. And then after a day or two, the oil spill model predictions can be believed. The data could also come from eyes on an airplane, someone flying overhead, airborne imagery, even reports on boats of where the thick oil is. But to predict the trajectory, and therefore, what parts of the coastal ecosystem are under the greatest threat, one needs to um, tune the models. Remote sensing can help a lot with that. Finally, what damage is done to the ecosystem? And the important thing there is to attempt to acquire remote sensing data before the oil gets to the shoreline. So one can do a before and after comparison. And oil can be, um, the damage from oil can be derived from remote sensing data, whether it's MODIS or other sensors that will allow one to look at uh, collapse of canopy, grasses being dying, uh, vegetation turning yellow and dying. However, things may die for reasons unrelated to oil. If you have observations before and after, they can be compared. It may take a few days for the oil to get to shore. It may take a couple of days for the vegetation to die. So when the spill occurs, there still can be uh, time to collect that data. Um, 
one of the biggest problems with uh, planning for oil spills is that uh, anyone who has been involved in oil spill response will tell you every oil spill is unique and special. And the lessons learned from the last oil spill are unlikely to apply to the next one. There will be new lessons to learn, um, except in, the, in a general sense from the previous uh, lessons. And one of the areas where these questions are the most important to think is we've never had a major oil spill, at least not recently, in the Arctic, the Exxon Valdez being a spill from a time when there was no real remote sensing capability and in a confined inlet. So one question that one can think about that was very valuable is how would one respond to an oil spill in the Arctic? Uh, please keep that in mind as just a thought process as we now get into the details of how to um, do remote sensing of oil spills. When Deepwater Horizon first occurred, it appeared as a smoke plume as, a smoke plume as the rig burned um, with very little oil in the water. And in this modus scene that uh, spans almost 1,500 kilometers or so, 1,000 from east to west, a huge synoptic view, um, you can also see uh, elements from the Mississippi River outflow sediment plumes that could become confusing for oil spills. In the visible, and MODIS was the workhorse of the remote sensing of deep water because MODIS maps the entire Earth's surface every day, two sensors, so actually two maps are generated um, at 250 meter resolution. So everywhere is covered. All the other sensors that I'm going to discuss later have to be targeted or only look at a small area. What does MODIS see when it sees oil? It sees the effect of the oil on changing the wave field on the surface, i.e. the reflection of sunlight in the sun glint. So in this scene here, um, and let me move the arrow, we have oil over here, which is um, looking rather similar to this circled area to the lower right, which is not oil. We know it's not oil because the oil had not yet reached into that area. But it very much looks like oil. And this is really just an effect of sun glint and this wave field because of low winds being very calm. This is not diagnostic. This is an example of a false positive. You would not want to send boats or airplanes out to the red uh, ellipse area because you'd be wasting resources that are needed to look at the oil closer in. Modus synoptic imagery also misses all of the fine structure. So in this oil patch that was from early on in the spill up here where the green arrow is, one might look at that and go, wow, that is solid oil 100 miles across, 150 kilometers. It's just solid oil from one end to the other. The reality is, though, that when one looks at a digital globe image that has much higher resolution, you can actually see that much of the area of the sea surface doesn't have oil. It's clear and the oil is constrained to very thin streamers. This is an example of how, because of the poor resolution, it might be difficult to use MODIS to target where to send boats um, to go. One would send an airplane, which can cover a significant amount of area, and then the airplane can uh, provide this finer detail. Um, if we zoom in even further from that last image in the digital globe, you can see that even when we're zoomed out and each of these boats is about 50 meters long, when we go in, there's actually a lot of very fine scale structure. And this is the reality of how oil arranges itself in the environment with 
a significant fine scale structure that gets lost at the coarse resolution of satellite remote sensing or most satellite remote sensing. Um, I should note Digital Globe can acquire very high resolution imagery, um, 30 centimeters in grayscale. However, they cannot cover the entire planet. That's too much data. And so they miss the synoptic view, but capture the resolution. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, um, there's thermal imagery also provides um, passive observation opportunity for oil in which because oil is thick and dark compared to the surrounding water, it is hot. There's also some other reasons why oil has a thermal contrast with the surrounding water. And you know, in this thermal imagery shown here, um, one can see where the thick oil is. Um, in general, it's well known and argued that you can't see thin oil with thermal, only the thick oil. In the lower left is, is a classification of, of this oil thickness um, that was based on primarily the thermal uh, image. So um, the example of the thickest oil in satellite imagery that was recorded for um, its temperature contrast was recorded by the AVHR, which is a weather uh, satellite back in 1991 uh, when a very large amount of oil was released during the war into the Persian Gulf and created a temperature difference of almost 10 degrees centigrade. Um, now, I, I did say that it's well known by everyone that thin, that thermal can't see thin oil, except that that's only for people who haven't read this paper by Grierson, um, 1998, uh, where they did a planned release and used a very sensitive thermal imager, at which point they were able to see thin oil. So what this paper shows is that, number one, Conventional wisdom on what you can do with oil is often incorrect and wrong, um, and that people draw conclusions that are supposedly based on physics, but actually are based on uh, limitations of the instrumentation. Right. SAR, synthetic aperture radar, can work day or night. This provides useful ability to capture remote sensing data when there is no sun to um, improve models. Um, there is no current SAR system that maps the planet. Um, however, SAR can be, the SAR platforms that are up there can be targeted and told to point. So in the visible, which is uh, he observed here on the left, um, one can see the infamous tiger tail configuration of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill with lots of thick oil in the head. However, SAR responds by seeing the effect of oil on changing the wave field of the surface and doesn't easily discriminate for the existing satellites between thick and thin. Moreover, uh, it, the SAR clearly suggests that there is oil in this area here to the southwest of the main body of oil in the spill. Yet from looking at the visible, there is clearly no way that there is oil in that area. This is clean water that's kind of coming into this part of the spill based on currents. SAR has false positives. You know, here's an example of one far from the spill. It looks like the spill in the data. What's really happening is there could be slicks from convergence zone that have nothing to do with oil, false positive, or from low wind areas like in this area over here. You know, and the um, in the thermal, 
uh, structure that's not visible in the visible um, on the left is revealed in the thermal image, which shows where the thickest oil is, because as we notice, that depends on the temperature. Um, MODIS does have thermal imagery, so thermal imagery could allow one to refine more so where to send uh, um, operational equipment, airplanes, and so on than in the visible. But in thermal, there are false positives. Here, you can get temperature effects due to currents and so on. However, by comparing that image with the visible, you can confirm that it's outside the area where you would expect to see oil. So it's certainly valuable to look at um, the information in both the visible and the thermal to get a better understanding. Okay. Now, if SAR has good signal to noise, then there is some indication that it actually can see thick oil. Um, and so here we can see in this SAR image um, some structures in the center that have been linked from the visible to oil that is uh, thick. Um, those white dots are oil platforms and facilities as well. And here's where Deepwater Horizon in the, at this day was. Um, but it's not exactly clear what precisely the SAR is seeing when it sees thick oil. So let's review what SAR sees when it sees oil. This is airborne SAR, which has far, far higher signal to noise and spatial resolution than satellite SAR. What SAR sees is it reflects off the surface of the water based on the capillary waves that are comparable to the wavelength of the SAR and the angle. Um, oil flattens out, it smooths out, it removes these capillary waves. And as a result, oil looks dark because the radar is not reflected back to the sensor. Another way, though, that the SAR, the radar, interacts with the oil or the ocean surface is that there is a reaction based um, an electromagnetic interaction uh, between the seawater and the radar. And oil um, has a different dielectric constant than water. So if the oil is thick enough, some recent studies have shown, uh, that you can then see the thick oil in SAR because it's changing the electric properties of the sea surface. And so now we can look at this again image and once again see these here are areas where the dielectric constant is being changed and it actually goes brighter, reflects better. Okay, SAR is not diagnostic. Diagnostic, just as when you go to a doctor, is showing or is determining conclusively that the uh, thing you're looking at that's making you sick, in this case for the ecosystem, is oil and not something that looks similar but is a false positive. Um, and that's where spectroscopy comes in. Oil has, as we mentioned earlier before, carbon-hydrogen chains that have a unique signature, which in avarice data for the Deepwater Horizon spill were identified, um, and I'll move the arrow, were identified in the field data. So these are specific to petroleum hydrocarbons. Uh, algae, um, metal, water, sargassum, seaweeds, will not produce these signatures. That doesn't mean there are no false positives. Uh, in analyzing this data, uh, it was found that um, boats that are painted with petroleum hydrocarbon-based paints and oil platforms showed a positive signature for petroleum hydrocarbons because paint has petroleum hydrocarbons in it. Um, and so 
you know, one needs to use even this kind of spectroscopy, it's diagnostic, but intelligently to discriminate between oil and refined oil products such as paint. The way that um, we were able to, during Deepwater Horizon, figure out the thickness of the oil was because we're looking in the infrared, water absorbs strongly in the infrared. So if the light could penetrate through the slick, as soon as it hits the water, it's absorbed. If the oil was very thick, it would actually bounce around inside and reflect back up to the surface without hitting the water and getting absorbed. Um, so as a result, the shape of the feature, the longer side of the shape, is affected more than the shorter wavelength side of the shape based on how thick the oil is. The, because the wavelength, how well it penetrates, varies. And this skew was used to derive the thickness. But because we're talking about penetrating through oil to water and getting absorbed, water in the emulsion was also very important and had to be derived. Uh, here you can see um, on the right the oil thickness um, for different the different species of sorry the different spectral features and white is thickest and what you're observing here is that same kind of structure that was pointed out earlier we're at the leading edge of the oil the oil is thicker and then downwind opposite to that the oil becomes thinner so this is a texture that the human eye can use to confirm that the remote sensing derived oil thickness map makes sense, physical, not in, you know, a, a false positive. Avarice was flown um, on May 17th and collected uh, data over the oil spill at the same time-ish that MODIS collected data. However, MODIS collected the, this snapshot in one second and Avarice took nine hours. During those nine hours, the oil moved. So it became rather difficult to compare, except for this one right here, where they were almost contemporaneous. The oil thickness maps in MODIS and in Avarice. Because, again, satellite gets you an instantaneous snapshot, but airborne can take quite a while. And as you noticed in that image, um, even with all that time, only a small fraction of the spill was covered. Currently, thermal remote sensing uses only the temperature contrast, but it doesn't have to be that way. There are spectral features in the thermal infrared that can be used to diagnostically identify oil. Um, they're uh, related, and this has been shown in the laboratory. Um, however, the uh, uh, no current instrument is is using these features that's available today. So this is a capability that could become available in the future, but not currently um, uh, available. I want to also introduce um, that remote sensing, while the primary an initial triage is to answer questions related to how much oil is there, where is the thickest oil, and so on. And that is the focus of most oil spill research that you'll see. Remote sensing can do so much more. Remote sensing can also answer questions related to how um, effective uh, response is. And what you can see in this um, image here is that where the dispersants were sprayed, the surface appearance of the oil changes. When looking at that with an airborne LIDAR, you can see that the dispersed oil is into the water column. So this is a way of using LIDAR to confirm 
that remote sense that um, an application of dispersants is effective. And, and that same pattern of oil into the water column was also observed from space-based LIDAR, Calypso, during Deepwater Horizon. Okay, fires also produce a signature that remote sensing can see. And these little red dots here where there are fires and then there are streams of plumes of smoke coming out from each of them. These were during the Iraq war where oil wells were lit on fire. You know, and that smoke is toxic, is advected, and can be observed from remote sensing. And this information from the smoke remote sensing, similar to the way one might do it for a volcanic eruption, can be used to warn downwind populations to perhaps not go outside without a breathing mask, you know, even a painting mask, or a, it would be helpful uh, to avoid inhaling oil smoke particles or for people responding. Um, interestingly, when you have fire, it actually has a thermal signature in the shortwave infrared because when it's hot enough, the shortwave infrared is thermal. Um, in this particular interesting uh, satellite image, based on one of the center sensors on MODIS uh, on the um, EO1 where MODIS also sits, a plume of smoke presumably from in situ burning, because there's nothing out in the middle of the ocean, was observed. Interestingly, this is coming from a part of the scene where there is no record that anyone was conducting an in situ burn. So in the official data, there is no record of this happening, and yet the satellite clearly captured it. So to um, kind of summarize some of the key points, there are a lot of advantage to remote sensing. Pattern recognition can have false positives. All of them can have false positives. And yet combined, you can reduce the false positives and include increased confidence. Um, spectroscopy, where you can do it, which involves use of many colors rather than, say, a single gray color, really helps. Again, the analogy here is think of a color picture versus a black and white grayscale. Many things that are confusing in black and white become clear in color. Um, and uh, I, I think because of the time, I'm not going to talk about the Arctic, but I think everyone can think about that. And um, who knows, it may be a homework question. And I'd like to thank you for your attention and say we're ready for questions and whatever uh, other information needs to be shared. So thank you very much. Be sure to tune in next week where we talk about storms, floods, and landslides. And we will open up questions now. Thank you.